So let's, let's imagine that you are in charge of managing a pond somewhere. You're not uh, an algae specialist, but you're a biologist. You're managing a pond for a company. You know, like ponds might be in, in various places, in malls and in all the complexes that people live in. There are various aquatic systems that, and there are companies that maintain this. So your, your company is maintaining something, and suddenly you see uh, one time you come in to do some testing, and this is floating all around in there. This green scum. You want to find out more about this green scum. So, what's your first course of action? Let me hear somebody. What's the first thing that you do? You see this floating around. What's the first thing you would do? You want to find out what it is. Yes, Timothy. Collect samples. Collect samples. Yes. There you go, Bob. <laughs> Collect samples. What else? I'm not moving from this spot because I want to stay on camera here. Right? <laughs> I'm going to take that off eventually. I I... <laughs> or I can leave it, maybe. <laughs> you take samples. Very good. What else? What, what, what? Obviously, you take the sample. You want to do something with it, right? Analyze. Analyze. You... Right, you take it back to the lab, to your, to your area, and you look at this with a microscope. For what purpose? To like, observe its traits. To observe some traits, some things about this, with the hope of doing what? I identify what, what organism it is. What organism it is. And in this 21st century that we live in, the year 2015, how would you propose about to do that then? You've got, you've got this below the microscope. You're not going to keep your eye below the microscope all day looking at the specimen. So how would you take, how would you record what you see with the microscope so that you can take it away and begin your search? Take a picture. Take a screenshot of that and bring it to your computer. Right. So taking a screenshot of this specimen or taking a picture of what you see under the microscope, is that a problem for anybody in here? How would you do that? How would, could somebody tell me how they would do that? Have you done that before? Do you need a special camera to do it? We have special cameras that can fit on, on top of the microscope, but you don't need one anymore because your phone camera can do that. Right? And uh, most people can have, have done that all day long today and they've been taking lots of pictures. So that's what people would tend to do nowadays. But what about a biologist working, let's say, in the year 1985? The same problem in the year 1985 they take this back to their lab. Uh, what would they do next? Draw it. They would draw it. Most likely they would draw it, even though the microscope camera was invented at that time. It did exist. It was a piece of, of, of expensive technology to have a camera that could take a picture of what you see under the microscope. Of course, nobody <coughs> had phones like people have now. <coughs> so to take a picture of what was under the microscope, uh, you, you needed a, an expensive microscope with a special fitting. And even if you did have to take a picture in those days of a specimen, it wasn't going to be with a camera like we have now. How, was, how, were, how would somebody, if they did take a picture of a specimen, let's say you're studying a beetle or something, something that you can actually take a picture of, what would you, how would you be able to like, get what's on the picture? What did people do when they took a picture in 1985 is a question that I know the answer to because I lived in 1985. But. I don't know that all of you know the answer to it. Uh, you use film and you like, put, put into like uh, some chemicals and then you, you get the photographs. <laughs> you, you would have film. When you take your picture, you would have to hope that, it's, that you didn't get your finger in front of the lens maybe because if that happened, that would just, you don't know that that happened at that point. Uh, so you take it away. You have to wait till your whole roll is full. So like if it's your parents' camera and it's a picture number three, you'll probably have to wait until they go away for the summer and they take the full roll of 24. Then they come back and so you won't necessarily be able to get your picture right away. Unless you really wanted it, well then you could, could let's just let, the, let's just let the, the rest of the shots go to waste or take some other pictures that very quickly just of your family and whatnot. And then, um, then go get the pictures processed. Where? It's not something you could just do in your house. How do you do it, James? Black room. A dark room or a black room. Um, 
usually they, you would go like to a place like the mall and you would have to like turn in your your film you'd have to like pay pay some money up front and then they would tell you come back in two weeks and you come back and you get your images and that was just 30 years ago so this little piece of technology of how, about how we take how we record images it just shows how science has changed because of technology in the last 30 years and now we've got the smartphone that's not, not just being used for this but used for so many other things when people go out searching for lichens and I hope that everybody goes out searching for lichens before this year is up because it's it's going to be something that we'll have to upload on ManageBack if you're shy to upload on Facebook you can, you'll have to upload on ManageBack <laughs> and you'll have to upload your pictures of lichens and if you have a smartphone with you like well like one person did today had, had a smartphone with her she was able to get the full GPS coordinates of where these pictures were being taken of, of the lichens and it's, it's just a, to keep your eyes open for something that we're studying in biology collect some data and let that data be a part of something bigger which is what scientists can do so much more easily now than they did in the days of Darwin and the days of uh, um, Mendel and other people, right? Collaborate and share data. So that's why we have initi we've initiated the Global Lichen Project. Today, we want to see how scientists go about in their scientific way to identify things and how a layperson can, might go about today in the 21st century trying to identify this. The layperson meaning you guys, which you're not really lay people because you guys already know that this is what? what what's the green scum? What's the green scum called, Anna? Yeah, the one that's floating around in here. Uh, algae. algae, right? We know that's algae. Not everyone knows that this is algae. So we've already we already have a, a, a starting point, because it means because we know it's algae, then we can go into a book <laughs> like this, like this one here, and start searching when we look under the microscope. Right, Stephen? You like the name of this book, don't you? I love it. <laughs> right. Anyway, would you do? Would you go with that option to search this book to find out what algae you're seeing with your microscope? This book with no color images in it whatsoever. Would that be your choice? Yuxu, would that be your choice? What would you do? <laughs> Look on what? So people had the answer all day. What would you do? Search Google Images. <laughs> or you could search some other search engine. We don't have to advertise for Google. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steven? Right, so you can start looking that way. And that's, but you, you will need some data to begin with. You'll need a good image, and then you start searching. As you start searching, you would find out that it's useful if you can describe your specimen using certain good biological language, some basic terms. In other words, this system that we're about to study, about how it works for identifying a specimen, it's really not something that everyone can use. You must have some kind of fairly basic knowledge within the field that you're working. In other words, if you don't know what chloroplasts are, you'll, you'll be lost. If you don't know what uh, filamentous means, or if you don't know what chlorophyll is, you don't know what a nucleus is and what a vacuole is, then it, it's going to be hard to follow the scientific way to identify this. So the scientific way of identifying this using an identification key is not some arbitrary thing that, that's just requiring us to identify like a lion or a tiger or an elephant or something like that. That could be used to teach you how a key works, but it's really not going to give you the purpose of a key. Because if someone gives you a bunch of animals that you already know them well, you'll ask, what's the point of this key? I already know that's an elephant. I already know what this is and what that is. The point of a key is really appreciated when you see something that nobody knows what this is. We say it's algae, but you want to write up a scientific report like we're writing up our lab report right now. What, what's the name of our specimen that we're writing about right now? Pigna radiata. Right. Pigna radiata. The mung bean. And that's so that no one has any doubt about what you're working with when you write up the lab reports because it might be called by a different name in Thailand, it might be called by a different name in Vietnam, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Africa, in North America, it might be called by different names all over the world. 
But when we write in our report that we're speaking about Vijna Radiata using the system of binomial nomenclature or the binomial system, which scientists have agreed upon using this system through a series of congresses. What's that, Timothy? Have you heard about a series of congresses? What do you think that means? You never heard of it. What do you think it means? It's the word right up here. A series of congresses. Scientists have agreed upon this, this two-name system through a series of congresses. What does that mean? Surely you have some feeling about what it means. A bunch of meetings, yes, yes. I've never seen this term like a series of congresses before. So the IB wants us to... To, to, to think about this word. It's just a bunch of big, high-powered meetings where the biologists come together to decide, look, we're going to keep this system of two names, just like we said Vijna Radiata. Today we're going to try to find out the two names that go with for this thing. When you find that out, you'll realize that you've opened up the door on a lot of information. You can then research lots of scientific papers to find out what this might mean if it's in your aquatic system. Is this something that we should remove? Or we can leave it in there. What's the best way to remove it? Maybe someone studied that already. But all of that information is kept from you because you don't know its name. Right? It's like someone's searching for you, Stephen, in this school. And they, they say, I'm looking for this guy. I, I'm not sure if he's Korean, but he goes to SAS. That could be so many people. Right? That could be so many people that you're searching for. So I'm looking for this green thing that, floated, that floats around in the pond. You really don't know what that is, right? So therefore, if you know the name of it, then it opens up all the scientific research papers for you. But how do you go about getting its name? We're going to try our arbitrary way right now, which is, have we agreed what way that is? Is anybody, does, does anybody want to borrow this book to, to search for the algae? Its name isn't here. In two pages, you can borrow it, right, and try it. <laughs> And you'll see how this works. But there's another way that I think a lot of you want to go with. What's that way? But two people want to go with this way, so we'll let them have this book, right? That's, that's old school, you know? Some people still like to, to listen to, to the Beatles and to Elvis and things like that. So. You listen to that kind of music, yeah? <laughs> well, you can still use the old school way. Um, you can go in, you can, do a, you can do a drawing by pencil and go into this book and start searching. Or we can take a picture with our smartphones and sit with our computers and do like what some people call the reverse Google search. This morning, some Tony told me he'll use Siri. Uh, you guys know that you can like, that's the name of, the, uh, of what? What do you call it? The voice on, on the Apple smartphone? Siri. The iPhone? Siri? So you can ask Siri. Some people say that, some people claim that you can dump this picture into a website and get feedback on what it is. I don't know that any of those, I, I don't have any information that, that anyone's done that yet in this class. But that could be coming. And when that comes, just like drawings, kind of like we don't see the point of drawing anything now, but Charles Darwin had to draw. When I went to school in 1985, I had to draw. But you don't see the, the importance of drawing anymore because the camera is at your fingertip to take a million pictures. But this, in the same way, this scientific way that we're about to look at using the dichotomous key, Constructing it and using it could be on its way out if we can take a picture of any specimen, put it onto a database, and then get, then get immediate feedback on its biological name and all the stuff that we want to know about it. But for that database to be good, what is it going to need to have happen from people? For any database to be good, what do we need? What do we need, Stephen? We're trying to build this database on lichens. What are some of the things that could make it like be like a total flop? Reliable, reliable, re reliable information, reliable data to put into this system. So people are still going to have to be out in the field with their cameras, describing things, giving information. First of all, uploading a lot of information onto this database. So that's at some point, maybe you guys might be working on some software or some website that's going to try to catalog all of life on Earth. To the extent where when we take an image of anything and we put it onto this website, people can get all the research papers and everything coming back at them. I don't know that that's out there uh, for anybody to use right now. Certainly not for us to use right now today. 
So we're still going to go old school and try to see if we can uh, take the image with our phones, then go sit, sit down and see if we can come up with the biological name that's been given to this specimen. And the biological name is going to be based on some natural classification system. It's important that a good classification system is natural. And we don't say we're going to put all the plants with the letter M under this category. Because then you don't know what letter this begins with. You, this can't speak back to you. All you can do with this is observe traits about this. Traits from the outside and not from the inside. So the identification system, therefore, must be based on fairly easily observable things that you can see from the outside. The, 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 the technical thing about it is that communication won't be efficient unless you use some biological language. So therefore, the true dichotomous key that's your, that you're using in a meaningful way to identify something fairly obscure like this would require you to have some basic knowledge of what you're looking at. So all of that stuff is going to be required to make the key work efficiently for you. But you're not trying the key method right now. You're just going to get your data on this algae with a camera or with a paper and pencil drawing and try to see if you can identify it. Uh, more than six, seven people have identified it all day long. So people have been, uh, with some effort, coming up with the identity and with some luck. We'll see if you can come up. And then you go on to manage back and you read the instructions. I want you to reflect on the first method that you're using to try to identify this. And then on my video, which if you click right here, you'll get to go to my video. Right. I'll put the link on later on. It's not, it's not really that you can't click right here. <laughs> right. I'll put the link on there later on. Right there on the video is where it will be. You click there, you go to that lesson, and you'll see how to use a simplified dichotomous key to identify these, this algae. And then I want you to reflect on, well, was my way of just searching for images on Google or looking through the textbook uh, for pictures, was that the better way? Or is it using this, the dichotomous key that was made by biologists, for biologists? It's not just something that's made for, pe for kids in kindergarten to use. It's made with a certain amount of biological language. So if you don't know how, if you don't know some basic stuff about algae, you really won't be able to use the key. All of you will be able to uh, figure out most of it and use it. And you'll be able to compare using a dichotomous key to identify a specimen with this arbitrary way that we're about to try now. Some people will succeed with the arbitrary way with no set method. But when you succeed that way, I want you to reflect on how the key method works and see, put down your thoughts. So exactly what you have to upload is all the, all the evidence of what you're doing today, which on ManageBack you have the information. And then, not for homework, but next class, when we click here and we go to the lesson, it will tell you that you have to make your own key. You have to make your own key based on features of arthropods. Arthropods are a group that we don't really see them like lions and tigers so clearly. They're kind of like, not microscopic, fairly easy to see, but not as obvious as mammals. They have certain technical names for their various parts. So I want you to build your key using this one that we're going to use today that you'll see the example of how the algae key is built. And then I'm going to give you a picture of a bunch of arthropods which are things like insects and scorpions and spiders. And using the algae key as a model, then I want you to stop at the point on the video where it says stop. And don't go beyond because you'll get the answer and it will spoil your fun. So you <laughs> stop at that point, you try to build your key, and we'll be doing that next class. So that's how we're going to focus on this, this skill of constructing a dichotomous key for identifying specimens. And a bad key would be one where people are just taking all kinds of uh, frivolous things that can't be easily observed, and you're not using good biological language. It's, it should be written with some kind of biological language appropriate for an IB biology student. So we are supposed to study about these specimens in a different understanding. So therefore, you also want to study about, um, um, do some research on all the parts of the arthropods and before you make your key. So this key will be the model, and that one will be the activity to see if we can build a key of our own.